Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to B-Sides Las Vegas. Uh, we next uh, have Bobby Filler, and he's going to be giving a talk, Accelerating Adoption of Domain-Specific Languages with Large Language Models. Um, a few things before we begin this presentation. Uh, we'd like to thank our sponsors. Our uh, diamond sponsor is Adobe, and our gold sponsors, Prisma Cloud, Sem Group, and Blue Cat. Uh, it's because of their support that we're able to put on events like this. Um, so we really uh, appreciate their support. Uh, for cell phones, if you guys have cell phones, if you could please put them in the put them on in silent uh, and avoid using them throughout the duration of the of the talk, uh, unless you take pictures and stuff. And uh, at the end, if we have time, uh, walk around with a mic for questions. Um, and if not, and we do run over, uh, you can always pull the speaker aside for questions. But without further ado, Mr. Bobby. Hey, thanks a lot. <clears throat> All right. Yeah. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Yeah. So, uh, so welcome. Uh, thanks everybody for coming out. My name is Bobby Feiler. I'm the head of data science at Sublime Security, email security startup. This is my talk on Babelfish, which is accelerating adoption of domain specific languages for large language models. Uh, that's a lot of alliteration very early on. So we're going to just move right into why I'm actually here. Um, I work for a company that has a, a query language. I see a lot of shirts in here representing companies that have query languages. They are pervasive. Um, that's a great thing. They make life a lot easier in a lot of ways. They really open up your platform to more customizable ability. Uh, you know, you, you get your engineers committing to things much faster. Everything's much more tailored. It's overall, I, I think, a great uh, a great option and a great experience. Um, but because they are becoming so pervasive, security workers often have to learn like five or six, depending on their full suite of tools. And that can be uh, a little daunting, I think, particularly for uh, new people uh, in the detection engineering space. Um, I think that initial onboarding period can be a little difficult as well, when you really just want to pick up a tool and start using it and learn on the fly. So that's really what uh, this open source Babelfish kind of endeavor is about. It's about reducing that barrier of entry and trying to increase adoption rate and onboarding experience as much as possible. So how do we do that? I, I think before we dig in there, I just want to really drive the point home via like an anecdote, uh, if you will. And this is one that I run across. Even though I'm a data scientist, I still have to write rules for my company um, just to make sure that my models work. Uh, on the left, you have your, your hypothetical phishing email. It gets forwarded to your abuse mailbox. You as a security worker see it and you're like, all right, there's some Adobe branding. There's some language around there trying to get me to click financial information. You know, how do you go from that step to what you see on the right hand side, which is a sublime security rule? Um, it's not overly complicated, but there's a lot of nomenclature, syntax, kind of verbiage that is different, certainly different than maybe uh, Splunk or Sumo Logic or, or SEMGREP or, or something like that, where you know you have a completely different domain that you're attempting to apply. So how, how can we make this process, this jump from the left-hand side of the screen to the right-hand side of the screen more seamless? And I think one thing that we can do that's often lost upon, particularly the data science community, when we're like, AI will solve everything uh, and replace people, and it doesn't have to be like that. Uh, instead, we should be taking advantage of the things humans do really well. And one of the things that they do really well is they apply kind of an impromptu or, or maybe, I can't even think of a better way to describe it, a, a translation process where when they look at an alert, a piece of malware, a, a phishing email, they are running through a mental model built on domain expertise uh, that they've crafted over an extended period of time. Uh, and this mental model can, can turn up a couple different ways, but one of the ways that we see a lot is just a checklist. This mental checklist they go through where each question they ask and the corresponding answer is, is actually detection logic, if you think about it. Um, is this actually from Adobe? Is the language suspicious? Where do the URLs go? Were there any off failures in the headers? Each of these things are, are really just snippets of logic that when pieced together are a pretty effective detection recipe. So what we wanna do is really key in there and use large language models to capture that process to allow them to ask the question in natural language to learn the query language faster uh, over a period of time. 
And that, to me, is, is kind of, uh, I think, one of the bigger impacts large language models can make in the security space near term. Long term, tons of potential throughout uh, a variety of domains. I think short term, there's a, a unique opportunity to increase usability of your product. Um, those first couple of touch points with a new security platform, making it as simple and intuitive as possible for you to get in there and start contributing. Um, increasing speed and efficiency, not only of the onboarding process, but of contributing to rules and detection logic within a, within a platform. Um, reducing the likelihood of frustration or coding errors, which are commonplace in query languages, as somebody who's guilty of that all the time. Having a large language model what was trained on real world uh, working examples will, will help increase the likelihood of the code being produced being correct. Um, and then finally, one that I, I'm personally a fan of and works great you know, at, uh, at Hacker Summer Camp is just improve collaboration and communication. Anybody in your security organization can talk about a threat in natural language, and it would be great for them to be able to contribute to kind of the security hygiene uh, via these platforms in a more natural way. So with that sort of background, what did we set out to do when designing Babelfish? This idea of a large language model dedicated to natural language to code translation. Um, in order to use an LLM, you need a data set. Uh, Sublime Security is, uh, is growing, uh, but we're not Python. Uh, we're not even Splunk. Uh, there are not just troves of natural language and code snippets readily available on Stack Overflow or Twitter or forums and things like that. So we had to get pretty creative uh, where we pulled down this initial data set. Um, and I'm hoping by sharing this, you know, those of you in the audience that work for similar companies could kind of take this as, a, as an opportunity to maybe do the same. Um, we went through, we used our documentation, which gave us a really good background of syntax and the way, you know, we as engineers describe the language that we're providing people. The, the schema, the, the way we break down an email and expose it via the query language has a lot of natural language descriptions in it uh, that we could start to leverage. Likewise, open source rule repos and our Slack channel, community Slack channel, are really, really rich data sources for not only real world snippets that are effective, but the way uh, a diverse set of detection engineers describe their work. Um, so everything there uh, led us to a pretty, pretty decent sized data set. We still had some more complicated or complex like compound queries that required annotations. So for that, we pulled in a group of detection engineers internal and external to our company to like provide a, a natural language description, which is really cool. Um, certain people were very verbose and methodical in the way they asked for PDF attachments. And there were other people who were like, well, I should just be able to say is PDF attachment and then it just spits out the logic. And to me, that's, you know, that, that comes from experience, that comes from expectation of the product. And these are all things that I, I think the large language model can, can potentially help out with. Um, when it was all said and done, we ended up with a, a decent size, not a large data set, but a decent size, certainly enough to fine tune a model with about 3,000 examples. We uploaded that to Hugging Face uh, so people could pull that down and start playing with it immediately. Uh, I came from a couple of different data science groups that released Ember, which is a malware classification data set, very important to the open source kind of ML security space. I hope that as we continue to grow this out, uh, this can be a, another, um, another such data set to, to help further, further research. So once we had our data set, it was time to think about an ideal kind of large language model architecture. It's a 20 minute talk, so I'm not gonna get into the, to the guts of a transformer right now. Uh, there are books and videos and everything else. I'm just gonna come to you as, as somebody who wanted to provide an open source model the fastest and cheapest way possible. So these, this was like my, my set of requirements. Um, knowing that I wanted to do that, a pre-trained model was by far the most important thing. Pre-trained models, think of OpenAI and, and Claude and uh, Anthropic, a few others. Um, these are built, uh, they cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, they're trained on tons of data on a variety of tasks code translation being one of the big ones. Um, but this knowledge base and the API access, uh, Python libraries, 
large support networks where you could go and ask questions and get help. Uh, all fed into this final, like, it needed to be inexpensive because we were just going to give this thing away for free anyway. Um, so what we ended up settling on was a fine-tuned GPT-3 model. Um, if you're familiar with that, there are like three variants. There's DaVinci, which was used for ChatGP. It's very, it's very good. Uh, it's a little slower and it's way more expensive. And then you have Ada kind of at the opposite end, which is very inexpensive, um, very fast, but not, not very good at code translation tasks. So we found kind of our perfect bed uh, to sleep in with Curie. Um, it's a mid-tier, it excels at code translation tasks. Um, it's very fast, so when you think about integrated into uh, like a VS Code plugin, the translation step is, is very quick. Um, it's also very inexpensive to run inferences against, which again, because we were giving this away, we wanted, we wanted kind of the best of both worlds there. Um, as I said earlier, API access and cost from a resource standpoint were kind of critical. You can see on the right hand side to train these like very sophisticated models now is like 30 lines of code. Um, and it costs a dollar like $1.50 max to, to train, which is an insanely good price. Uh, it took like 90 minutes maybe. And when it was all said and done, we had a, we had a model we really liked uh, with, with good API access infrastructure surrounding it, and we were ready to kind of move forward. So once we had a model, we wanted to benchmark it quick just to give the community and frankly ourselves some idea of how effective it was from a code translation accuracy standpoint. Um, so we used PASAC K, which is an old information retrieval metric. Uh, it's still very useful for things like translation. Um, all that says is you have K number of attempts given a prompt to get the right answer. Um, we used three uh, because three is about the max that you want to go anyway if you're going to provide these responses to an end user uh, to try to evaluate and things like that. We did relatively well. Um, I think 98% of the time, within three guesses, it had the perfect response. I think after one opportunity to get it right, it was at like 93, 94%. So it was doing relatively well there. Um, we also integrated that with a, with a quick check with our MQL kind of executable or evaluation engine, just to guarantee that the, that the output was like, syntactically coherent and correct to avoid a lot of user frustration. Uh, all these uh, scripts and, and things like that are available uh, on the GitHub kind of posted below as well. From an implementation standpoint, we, we wanted to get it into hands of users as, as quickly as possible um, in a way or in an environment that encouraged them to use it. So we were thinking that a VS Code plugin would be ideal for that. The idea being that when they create a rule, they're going to be able to use that code completion uh, component, much like GitHub Copilot or IntelliSense or, or whatever. So I am not a uh, TypeScript developer by any stretch, but I was surprised how easy it was to get this off the ground using like event listeners to, to capture the user comment, a Flask backend uh, that a, a real developer on my team then then corrected for me and, and made it uh, all TypeScript. Uh, but push the, push the prompt down. We did a little bit of pre-processing in order to prep it to send to OpenAI. OpenAI came back with a response. We validated it and then pushed the screen using that text editor.edit function in, in TypeScript. And in the end, it worked, it worked really well. Um, and we, we've made that available. You can pull that down from the marketplace today. Uh, the actual source code is available too. Uh, so if you want to rip and replace your own back end or take out our model and put in your model, you're going to get that same sort of co-pilot style experience. Um, yeah, right off the, right off the shelf. Um, I was having issues with, uh, with demo life. So I, I, I basically recorded and I'll t talk through more or less what it does. But I mean, it's a demo where you type in English and it translates to the query language, which is not like the 
the most crazy demo that you can show right now. But the idea is, is like, you know, thinking back to that Adobe example, it's literally just as you're thinking these questions, being able to type them out and get the appropriate query language back. Um, and then having that validated using the, the interpreter on the back end is, I think, a, a nice way to learn. Um, I guess I use MQL on a daily basis and I still run into situations where I'm like, how do you, how do you move through this for loop or, or how do you do this part? And it would be really nice to just be, to be able to ask that question in the way I'm thinking about it, uh, as opposed to scouring through docs and, and doing that context switching. Um, so yeah, it, as you can see, you can get like moderately sophisticated in, in what it's doing, uh, some compound queries. I, there's plenty of room to kind of grow and evolve this capability, and I'll, I'll touch upon that in a minute. But yeah, this is uh, this is the the tool kind of in action, and, and like I said, you can pull this down today and, and start playing around with it. Um, any any feedback is always welcomed uh, too. So you could you could hit me up on Twitter or X. Uh, LinkedIn, whatever, to, to, to kind of talk about next steps and, and how to improve the, the process. Um, the last thing that we really want to do is, is get this in the hands of not only uh, customers, but we have a large open source community as well. Get it in their hands and start to understand whether or not this is a value add or a hindrance. And so we have a kind of robust set of user interviews lined up for the fall where we're going to do like a head-to-head -head against IntelliSense, which is like the VS Code built-in autocomplete, and Babelfish to try to understand task completion rates, uh, ability to avoid uh, context switches, um, what happens if Babelfish produces the wrong uh, code, like how does a user cope with that, and, and what does that prompting process look like? Being able to understand that and attempt to quantify it will be uh, instrumental in helping us kind of evolve the, the tooling. And then as far as a pass forward, I think what we talked about today or what I talked about today is primarily for those initial touch points into a platform. Um, not everybody wants to use a natural language. I don't think it should be force fed or, or anything like that. I think it is a valuable way to get exposure to a new query language and become familiar with it. But what we really are trying to do is move to more context aware code completion, um, using things like vector stores to capture common snippets that people use in their day to day. Things like first time sender is a good example. That's, a, that's one that's consistently used. It's a fairly large query uh, snippet. So being able to recognize that using like fill in the middle prompting, which is what GitHub Copilot uses, they, they look at where your cursor is, they look at everything that came before and after, and then they populate you know, the correct response. So being able to get those two things in there, as well as just continuing to increase the size and scope of the data set for the, uh, the open source community is, is gonna be pretty powerful, I think. So yeah, that's the, uh, that's the talk, uh, a nice, nice tight 18 minutes. Uh, if there are any questions, I'm more than happy to to answer them. You had oh. you had semantic parsing on the last slide. What can you get into that more? Or yeah, yeah. So the idea there is to more tightly integrate our uh, and, and this could be for whatever query language, but the actual interpreter and and get that in there to help. To right now, we rely on the GPT tokenizer, which is okay. Uh, but our like our own internal uh, interpreter would do a much better job at tokenizing at the level that we needed to. So capturing those semantic relationships and and in theory making the prompting uh, that much stronger as well. But yeah, that's that's a good question. Um, any plans to support like a test driven design style strategy? Like I. Don't know how to get to this kind of answer on say a test data set but i'd love to get there on the big data set now yeah so i think um you know supporting like the test driven development approach is something that would would make a ton of sense for us um i could see that being w w extremely useful for you know other vendors that you see kind of in the hall as well it's just this idea of um yeah, taking a look at, we, we've thought a lot about, oh geez, what was it? Um, 
like snippet back to description as well is a way to better understand what's going on. Uh, we have a lot of a lot of examples where a user will check in a rule that is heavy on regex. And you're like, that's great. I'm sure that's useful, but I have no idea what that does. So being able to feed that to a model and have that break down for you, what it's attempting to do to determine whether or not to allow it into this community rule repo uh, to help out with testing and, and things like that is, is certainly, a, I think, a natural extension. Yeah. Any more questions? All right. Oh, one, one more. Uh, my other question is you you're using GPT three, just like curious why that over three point five or four. Is it yeah. easier to fine tune or uh yeah, I, I found it to be uh, super straightforward to fine tune. I think you know, progressing to those other models makes a lot of sense. I, I personally just like the ability of reproducibility. It'd be very easy to pull down that data set from hugging face and then in a couple lines of code just get it to where, you know, I, I got it. Uh, anybody in the audience could do the same thing. Uh, I think as GPT-5 comes out and 3.5 and 4 kind of kind of take the place of three as far as the uh, the API architecture. I think that'll be that'll be ultimately where we want to go because it's just bigger context spaces and, and stuff like that, which would be wonderful. Yeah. All right. Uh, I, I promised I'd give a shout out to my seven year old daughter who heard that it was being streamed and now thinks I'm a YouTube star. So Cora, uh, I'll see you in a couple days. Yeah. Thanks. Cheers.